So we're gonna talk, shift gears a little bit and talk about um, aortic regurgitation and potential uh, applications with TAVR. Uh, no relevant disclosures, we're part of a trial that will get mentioned in this talk. So I'm gonna give us a um, patient case framework to think about as we uh, discuss aortic regurgitation here. Um, a 76-year-old man with known moderate to severe aortic regurgitation, I put it in quotes because this is often much less uh, precisely quantitated on echo. Uh, whenever I'm curious, I, I call Manny and say, Manny, come on, is this moderate or is this severe? Like, in any case, longitudinally followed for valve disease, um, presenting now with acutely decompensated diastolic heart failure after a recent very complicated illness. He had had staph bacteremia, um, treated with IV antibiotics. No definitive source was ever identified. He had a TEE negative for endocarditis. Um, during that hospitalization, he was on a vent for three weeks, had a GI bleed with a hemoglobin that dropped to six, ultimately found to be from a duodenal ulcer. And then he spent three weeks in rehab um, and had just failing to thrive since then. Um, current blood cultures are negative off of any antibiotics for now a couple of months. And he comes in with classic heart failure symptoms. Um, additional comorbidities include hypertension, a prior DVT, IVC filter once he had his bleeding problems, and some hematuria. So these are patients we, we see. These are, what do we have to offer this gentleman? Here is his aortic regurgitation. Um, ultimately, when pressed, the echosonographers told us it was grade three with some uh, flow reversal in the ascending aorta, regurgitant fraction of 50% and ear of 0.38. You can see there's no obvious vegetation on the valve. This is a tri-leaflet valve uh, with preserved, you don't see it well, but you will, uh, preserved ventricular function and relatively normal size. Here is a CT. He does have some uh, aortopathy. How relevant is that? Um, a lot of our discussions this morning have been about selection of SAVR versus TAVR. That's uh, a huge issue, um, particularly in patients with AI. Max uh, ascending aortic diameter is 44. And then you can um, see here some of the, the size of the sinuses. Um, minimal coronary disease, um, his annulus on TAVR CT, we're always thinking about just technical aspects of the procedure as um, Dr. Almaraya so elegantly uh, showed us when, it, when we're thinking about not just this valve, but maybe the next one down the road, but um, good femoral access, perimeter of 87, an area uh, of in the 500s, and a mean diameter of 27. So the heart team gets together and, and discusses what, what do we have to offer this patient with aortic regurgitation. Um, given his long hospitalization, mechanical ventilation, three weeks of rehab, a bleeding ulcer, overall frailty, this gentleman did not eyeball well. He was felt to be very high risk for SAVR. Um, should we proceed with SAVR? Uh, does it affect the risk at all if we leave or go after the ascending aorta? Um, should we offer him TAVR? Um, you're thinking about off-label options, you're thinking about some other options, um, or do we just do nothing? Um, I think all of us would suspect he's not gonna do well if we do nothing. So let's take a minute to, to talk about what we know about TAVR and pure, you know, uncalcified native valve aortic regurgitation. Um, the short answer is not much. Um, we know this is being done. This is what the uh, structural interventionalists talk about in the hallway at you know, coffee breaks, ah, you know, let me tell you about this case. Um, I think a lot of us even have in our mind, um, having done probably two dozen off-label TAVRs for AI with commercially available valves, I, I had sort of a checklist of things that needed to be present uh, to be, to what I thought, be, be able to do, do the procedure safely. Um, there is a valve called the J valve that we have some data on. Um, we have used registries, which is a fantastic use for them to understand a little bit what real world outcomes are in scenarios like this. And then there is a pending uh, Align AR trial that I think will shed a lot of light onto, onto this. So, so briefly, um, the J valve, this is something that uh, was touted highly 
uh, probably in the mid 2000s, 2015 timeframe. Um, ultimately uh, completed a EFS type study uh, in China, enrolled 43 patients, 42 of which were successfully implanted. That's, you know, looks pretty good. Published in 2018 with 4.7% one-year mortality, and these are, of course, all high-risk or prohibitive surgical risk patients. So 4.7% one-year mortality, 2.3% stroke rate at one year, less than 5% pacemaker rate, and then 97% with either none or mild perivalvular leak at one year. Average mean gradients of 10. I mean, that looks phenomenal, really promising, but it's a transapical approach. Um, essentially, that approach for TAVR has, has already been consigned to the dustbin of history. Um, uh, in, in the 10 year, I'll say 10 year, but since commercial approval are now already, um, I don't think anyone believes a transapical approach valve for TAVR is, has any future in the market. So, and, and then actually J-Valve was acquired by a Chinese-backed company and kind of disappeared. Um, I asked knowledgeable people who, with inside information, what, what, whatever happened to this? And, and no one could tell me. I was actually preparing for this talk, um, consulting Dr. Google, and lo and behold, actually, literally last week, there is a redesigned version of the valve that has now in North America published, or will publish, um, 27 cases of a redesigned transfemoral approach J-valve. Um, only 22 of 27 were done uh, with procedural success, 81%, uh, and, and the, and the box I recognize is a little bit small, but, you know, this may not be, this may not be dead. Um, physicians that we know, uh, in China say that this is actually being done quite frequently in China. The data is just not published. This has not been rigorously studied. Um, <clears throat> What we do know about what's being done in the real world, so off-label TAVR and pure AR comes from some of the registry data. 9% um, of the TAVRs done between 2011 and 2014, so this is a bit, bit dated, but were done off-label. And of those, 40% of those were for aortic regurgitation. Those TAVRs done with commercially available devices then had lower procedural success, and when, I, when you dig in the numbers, it looks to be in the 80% range of procedural success, which we would honestly consider to be abysmal in this day and age. 21% one-year mortality, and 20% had moderate or greater PVL. So real-world use here of commercial devices, not stellar. Um, is that something you would offer this patient? Um, there are a lot of meta-analyses out there. The largest one I could find had 911 patients in it. Um, had about what the registry said, 80% device implantation success, 90% if you factor in or look at just newer generation devices. 7% um, moderate or greater PVL at a year, um, maybe lower in newer generation devices again, and a 9.5% 30-day mortality um, maybe again lower newer generation devices, but still not, not stellar uh, outcomes. So the heart team gets together again. We have um, off-label TAVR. None of us, when we really look at the data, are very excited about offering that. Uh, and certainly with my bosses listening, we didn't consider that. Um, not, not an ideal SAVR candidate, and, and medical treatment, we thought, was, was not something the patient wanted or, or deserved. So um, we'll talk now about uh, the, the Yenna valve and the Align AR clinical trial, which I think has the potential to be, to be a game changer. It's currently a pivotal trial, single arm, uh, sample size of 180 patients, which has taken a long time to enroll, um, primarily because of manufacturing challenges. The, the, the valve was not available because of manufacturing limitations for quite a while. So now that it's back up and running, um, they're actively uh, recruiting patients uh, quickly. The key design features, um, and it shares this with the uh, Yena valve, but it has these what are called locators that stick out, and you'll see an example of this, while the inflow of the valve is constrained inside a catheter. So these locators allow you to place 
know exactly where you are, place this in the bottom of the sinuses, and once the valve expands, it actually captures, it actively fixes and entraps the native aortic valve leaflets to hold it in place. So there's no calcium that you're relying upon for radial force. Um, you are actually actively engaging the native leaflets. So that's exactly what we uh, decided to do with this patient. He was a good fit for the, the Yenavalve pivotal trial. Um, brought him to the cath lab, standard TAVR approach at our institution, monitoring anesthesia care, primarily fluoroscopy guided. Um, you can see these locators with the inflow of the valve constrained inside a capsule that ultimately when you deploy this valve, the capsule goes ventricular and allows the inflow of the valve to expand and essentially pinch or entrap the native leaflets between the valve frame and these locators. So the key part of the procedure is understanding where your locators are and making sure that uh, you are outside the leaflets with the locators and through the center of the valve with your nose cone. So you use um, a, a lot of fluoroscopy to figure that out. You can also use TEE. Here is the deployment of the valve. Then this capsule moves ventricularly, expands the, uh, the inflow of the valve, and then there's an, a, a separate step that essentially pushes the, uh, the outflow of the valve uh, off of, its, um, off of it, the rails that hold it in place. And here's a follow-up uh, aortogram showing an excellent result. You can even see the leaflet in here, still trying to work, moving our locator around some. And then this gentleman on ECHO had complete resolution of his air regurgitation. He actually was discharged home day one and um, has now had over six month follow-up and has really taken off. So in summary, um, this is tempting to say that, that, uh, that the Yenna valve is gonna be a game changer. Dr. Palmaz taught us last night though that an attitude of negative objectivity might ultimately be prudent. So I, I tempered what I said here in my summary slide, um, but I do think dedicated TAVR valves to treat pure aort native aortic valve uh, regurgitation are gonna be a useful tool in our armamentarium. Um, and of course, the heart team is a critical tool in making sure that um, these patients are properly selected. This is, at this point, uh, off-label use has pretty dismal results generally, and uh, surgery remains a proven therapy in this field. So if surgery is not an option, uh, I think we are gonna have some better options soon. Thanks.